This is Stuart Stewart, and you're listening to Conversations. A little different kind of radio show, because all it is is conversations with people. Some you know, some you've never heard of, and some you're going to like instantly because that's who they are. Sit back and relax, and let me introduce you to my first conversation. I'd like to introduce the man sitting next to me. His name is Bonnie Rosenzweig, and as a continuing segment on our show, I like to have coffee with him because he knows everything about Hollywood and the business of show business. You see, he was the producer of Cagney and Lacey and the producer of Daniel Boone, and I probably left out one or two more. Probably Rachel. Rosie O'Neill, Christie, you know. But the, 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 the bottom line is he knows all of the things that go on behind the scenes, and we're going to have coffee every once in a while and share them with you. I was a big fan of Cagney and Lacey, and I'm always curious when a great idea actually happens and it becomes even bigger than anybody could imagine, where did it first come from? So my question is, how did you come up with the idea of Cagney and Lacey? In the 1970s, I was a single male, and just recently out of a, a, a long relationship, I had a marriage and then this relationship, and I was dating a young woman who I met at work. She was a writer, and uh, I was a producer of a short live television series. I was a gun for hire at Universal Studios. And we were at a movie in Westwood, California, a sexual comedy, I think you would call it, uh, a kind of a, it was an Italian movie called uh, Scent of a Woman. Not the scent of a woman with Al Pacino. People were laughing in the theater. Uh, I was enjoying the movie as well. And I noticed that she was sitting there with her fist clenched on the, on the uh, armrest between us. And I leaned over to her and I said, are you all right? And she says, this has to be the most sexist, ugly film, I, the most ugly, sexist film I've ever seen. I said, well, do you want to leave? She says, no. She said, you watch, later we'll talk. Uh-oh. So I, uh, you know, steeled myself for that and continued to sit and watch the movie. What happened next was maybe one of two or three miracles that have happened in my entire life. Uh, there was a moment of a, a, a Gloria Steinem calls it epiphany, a, the click. You know, they, when you understand something in a way you never understood it before. As I watched the movie, without making any conscious effort that I'm aware of, none at all, the movie suddenly transformed in my mind. It was no longer taking place in Italy in the 1940s. It was taking place in Stuttgart in the 1930s. And the women weren't women. They were Hasidic Jews, male Hasidic Jews. And what I then was watching was the most vile anti-Semitic movie I had ever seen. I, in other words, I understood something in a way that I had never seen it before. The, the, the view of women being even a majority in this country who are treated as second-class citizens and being ridiculed and made fun of in a sexist way. And it changed my life forever. And it made me uniquely qualified to make a show like Cagney Lacey. I was hungry for more of this information. And the woman I was with uh, gave me a series of books to read. You know, Betty Friedan, and, uh, and one of the books she gave me to read was Molly Haskell's From Reverence to Rape, The Treatment of Women in the Movies. History book. Fascinating book. Well done. Ac applicable to anybody today that wants to read it. Very, very good stuff and talks about the way Hollywood has always viewed women in the movies. And it says in somewhere in the context of that film, there have never been a buddy movie for women. There's never been a Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. There's never been a Paul Newman, Robert Redford movie. There's never been a, a uh, Elliot Gould and Donald Sutherland movie because they were popular in those days. And I thought to myself, well, I'll make one. And that was the idea for Cagney and Lacey. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. Well, how do you see the changes then 
compared to the way women are now treated in the business. They're, they're treated much better, of course, but is there something that's still separating them or isolating them from just being people in the business rather than being women in the business? Money. They're not paid as much. Why? Well, Sharon Glass and Tyne Daly at the time were they became the two highest paid women in the industry. They paid, were paid far less than uh, men in the same job, than stars of shows. Uh, 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 Sandra Bullock makes less money than George Clooney. Uh, uh, Angelina Jolie makes less money than, uh, than a, a, her equivalent in a, in a male star. It's, uh, the perception is, is that men make the decision about what movies we go see. They, they advertise, you know, it's interesting, if you watch television, they'll advertise movies on Thursday nights. Why do they advertise on Thursday nights? Because they're setting up the teenage boys for what movie they should see over the weekend. And the boys pick these action films, taking girls to them. I guess they think it makes them hot. I don't know. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense to me. But every now and then there's a movie that succeeds, like uh, in my era, a picture like On Golden Pond, which is none of the things that Hollywood thinks you should make a film about. And it's a great hit and a wonderful movie. Hollywood treats it as an anomaly. It's a mistake. It just happened. It wouldn't happen again because they have too many of the other kind of pictures in the pipeline. They are not going to change the way they do business. So uh, the reason, uh, the way they do business is, it is still, even with women in the positions of power, which they didn't have in my day, and now you have, it's still basically, they, 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 they are thinking like the men did. They are still marketing and merchandising the way the men did. When we came out with the 25th, anniversary edition of Cagney and Lacey. A woman was in charge of designing the cover for the, for the um, package. And she they had limited artwork. They only had what we had from, from the 80s that we'd made with the show. And with the, there was a shot with the two gals with their pistols out. She made the pistols bigger, more phallic, more, uh, more, uh, uh, more in keeping with what she thought an audience would. I said, well, that may, you may be right for, for teenage boys, but that's, that's not the audience for this show, you know, and they're going to laugh at us when they see us pandering to, uh, to them that way, and I made them put it back the way it was. Now, we didn't sell very many, so maybe she was right. How today can Hollywood justify paying women less because they're, they're basically women? Well, first of all, we're talking about less. They're still making tens of millions of dollars, you know. And, but secondly, the reason they can justify it is because the star, pictures starring men do better business. Now, why do they do better business? Is it because they're men as opposed to women? Because the way they, they advertise the film differently. I'll give you an ex examples that I know. I'm not current with the, what's going on. I mean, I observe and I have an, can give an educated guess things, but as an example, Cagney and Lacey went on the air uh, as a, uh, uh, and a, a series of reunion films. Uh, we were, um, we had been, we had, the series was completed. I made four movies with Sharon and Tyne uh, after the series had gone off the air in 1994 and 1995. The first one came on the air and was the highest rated movie uh, on any network, the highest rated show on any network. I was very proud of that. Two weeks later, the Rockford File reunion movie surpassed us by one-eighth of a rating point. One eighth, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, that's too bad. You know, I, I, I like being, I like being number one. I did a little research. I found out that CBS spent the equivalent of ten million more dollars promoting the Rockford File than it did on Cagney and Lacey. And they had, there, they had, there was a. Sh we had, didn't have as good a lead in because the Angela Lansbury show was preempted the night we were on, and they had the benefit of the Angela, Angela, Angela Lansbury show as a lead in. So they had. Benefits that we didn't have, and they had $10 million more in advertising, and that's how they did it. Well, you say, well, why would they, why would they give more to Rockford? Well, well I'm bias, I don't know, maybe they like Jim, they like Jim Garner, God bless him, who just passed away this week. Uh, they like him more than they like Sharon and Ty. No, I think it's, a, you know, the, they understand it better. The guys who run the advertising department at CBS understood Rockford better than they understood Cagney Lacey. Cagney Lacey was their mothers uh, being uh, nagging them, or or they were too 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 strident or whatever. They didn't li necessarily like the show. Maybe they didn't hate it, but they like Rockford better. 
It just, it's, a, it's a subtle thing. There's no, there's no pinning anybody down to it. It's boys club stuff. People who have power are reticent to give it up. Uh, it's true of Congress. It's true of anything you can name in our society. But why these things are and why we put up with them is a very good question. I, 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 you go to a hotel today and open the drawer with a laundry sheet in it, and you want to fill that out. It says man's shirt, uh, $1.50, uh, woman's blouse, $3. And nobody says, how come? What, what's the big deal? You know, it's just assumed, well, the woman's blouse must be frilly. But what if it isn't? It's not just in the entertainment business. It's, it, it, it's, it, it's in our society. It's, it's why little girls uh, should go to school that are all girls' schools and not uh, co-ed because it's in study after study it's proven they don't do as well in co-educational classes because the teachers, the teachers, the people who we, we give our children to, to, to help them, prefer to call on the boy students. The boy students are louder, they're more aggressive, they want to talk, and the girl students are back off in the boy's presence. And they don't do as well as they do when they're in an all-girl environment. It's, it, it's true of our entire society, it's systemic. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's even more true in the Middle East, where you know what happens if a little girl wants to go to school. Yeah. So these things are, uh, these are difficult to change, but you, what I take pride in is, is how much we've changed in American television, for instance, as a result of Cagney and Lacey. Before Cagney and Lacey, uh, you, we had to, in Cagney and Lacey, in fact, explain what, how these women got on the police force and why they wanted to be cops. Now you can't have a cop show where the woman, women aren't all, and nobody asks why you're a cop. The gal's the head of the, she's the head of the force, and nobody thinks anything about it. Or they're the doctor and not the nurse. All those things happened since Cagney and Lacey. Stephen Bochco who's a good, good friend of mine and a terrific filmmaker, made two great television shows. One was uh, uh, Hill Street Blues, and the other was um, uh, NYPD Blue. The difference between the two shows is Cagney and Lacey. NYPD Blue is Cagney and Lacey and drag. Yeah, I never thought of that, yeah. Okay, so, so it's, we, we not only, before Cagney and Lacey, when you went into a network to sell a show, you would come in and say to the network executive, uh, the guy's a private eye, but he's blind. Yeah. Ooh, that's the gimmick. That's the thing, right? After Cagney and Lacey, they said, okay, that's nice, but what's he like? Does he have a home life? Does he have a wife? Does he have kids? Does, you know, they wanted to, that's what we did. We didn't just feminize television. We humanized television. All these people afterwards, the show was not a gigantic hit initially uh, in America. It was a gigantic hit in the industry. On Monday night, you had no trouble getting a table in a Beverly Hills or Hollywood restaurant because all the TV executives were home watching Cagney and Lacey. You know, with, with everything that's going on in the world, what we really need is a superhero. And I keep watching the television every day because I'm hoping I'll see coming across the sky somebody with a cape or somebody with, with a big shield who can do magic and bring peace to the world. Well, there's nobody on the horizon, but I discovered a superhero trainee. Uh, tell us your name. Hi, I'm Joe, and I'm a superhero. And what is your mission as a superhero? Uh, to protect the innocent and, you know, help everybody out. And how are you going to do that? I don't know. Not a clue. I'm just going to do it. It's going to be a spontaneous kind of thing. Well, if you're a superhero, what superpowers do you have that makes you a superhero? I can recite the alphabet anytime you want me to, right there on the spot. Um, and I have uh, no other strengths other than that. So but you know the whole alphabet? I'm all, all 26 letters? Every single one of them. Can you do it real fast? Ready? Yeah, go. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, A, M, Q, and then I, I lose it sometimes. Oh, okay. So you, you need a little more training with training. that. Yeah, well, of course. Now, how long do you think you're going to need to train before you can actually say, I am a superhero? Uh, I'd say about uh, 13 years. Okay, so the world may end up in turmoil for another 13 years unless there are some other trainees out there. So if you're a superhero trainee, send me an email at aliveonsouthbeach at syndicatednews.net and we'll bring you on the show.
I looked up the definition of a Renaissance man. Yeah. And this gentleman is a doctor, a pharmacist, he's a writer. He's been a, known as the fight doctor because he's been a, a doctor to many of the world's champions. He's also the winner of two Emmys for fight analysis, and he did that for 25 years. You've I written. Got, I just got into the Hall of Fame of Boxing. And, another, and he's a member of the Hall of Fame of Boxing as a result of that. Yep. Except you even left out one thing. The main thing that I do, and the thing I do best, is paint. Well, I'm just, I'm just, best. I'm just getting to that. Okay, in, okay. A, in addition to, this is a long introduction, and I don't I, do this I for everybody. You, you know, but, you know, when people come and say, listen, you're going to introduce me, and you're going to introduce me fully, it's an embarrassment. It's a long, long way to go, well, because I had a very long life. I know, and, and you, you've got absolutely nothing to be embarrassed about. You've Not written seven books? Twenty. Twenty books, okay. Twenty books. And what do you do with your spare time? I know you have exactly. a family. No, no, no. That, that's that's a very that's a very good question that I would ask if I was interviewing me. You did what? <laughs> what did you do today? Well, I started a painting picture. Then after my nap, I came back and I painted the other half of of a short story that I dreamt about last night. And then I wait and I sat down. and I'm talking to you. And now some not and tonight I'm going to watch two football games. Well, that's what I, I do with my I've got I've got some questions to I, ask. You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm glad you're asking these questions. I always want to tell people it, it's not hard to understand if you just follow your interest. Mm -hmm. You're interested in football. Good. There's a great football game tonight. The University of Miami is playing, and the University. I mean, the Dolphins are playing. That those are two great things. So I'm very interested in that. So that that eats up my evening. That's, That's the way it, well, it is. I, 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 mean, I mean, it is that it is that I wake up every day, and, and I look in the paper, and I have something that I'm looking forward to every day. I read in uh, one of your bios that at age 14, you decided you wanted to become a doctor. Way before age 14. Okay, what event happened in your life that made you? Go and you know decide that. Well, was it that's, anything that's a good specific? question, but it's, it was you started with, it, with an error. When I was born, people put a football in, in the crib. <laughs> my father put a stethoscope in my crib. I swear to God, put a stethoscope in my. Crib. This kid's gonna be a doctor. And as you have to understand, I was very observant when I was little, and I observed this: the guy that came into my house that got absolute total work was the doctor. Uh -huh. If you get called for a house call and the doctor and you open the doctor, doctor, everybody in the house would turn on and be bowing and scraping and giving him a tray with soap and things. I mean, they treated him like a god. Would you share your age with us? Sure, I'm 83. And I know you're not ready for retirement, so what's well, in the future? Well, retirement, I write and I paint until I die. That's what I do. I, I cannot keep from painting. I love painting. I can't keep from painting. And I write a short story at least one a week. I've had over 200 short stories now. I, I believe that life happens the way it's supposed to. Exactly. Exactly. I, I just think that, that things happen the way they happen. I mean, I, I don't know why. I, I don't, I mean, I, I don't do it on purpose. But everything works out. When you look at my life as I'm writing it now, all of these things that I did, I actually did because other things fell through and I just kind of fell in. And then, therefore, I'm a renaissance man. No, I did what I had to do. The Witness Protection Program has always been something that we thought was created here in the United States. But history has shown us that it was created hundreds of years ago in France, and it was after the French Revolution, it was at a time when Cardinal Richelieu really ran the country, and it was the musketeers that saved the king and saved the country. But afterwards, instead of being rewarded, they were condemned, and there were warrants out for their arrest, and they just disappeared. And now, a couple of hundred years later, I'm proud to say I found one of them. Ladies and gentlemen, this is D'Artagnan. 
Welcome to our show. Thank you. Bonjour. How long, how long have you been in hiding? Uh, about a couple of centuries now. And you, what happened to the other musketeers? Well, they, uh, some of them went into private security businesses. Uh, Porthos and uh, Aramis uh, are, are running a, a, a fast food business uh, out of one of those little trucks that you park in different parts of the town. Uh -huh. And they've done very well. They're called the, the Musketeer Catering Service. They've done very well. I'm proud of them. Uh, and uh, we've just basically... Well, judging from the way you look, you look, look like you've done very well I, too. What have you been doing with your time all these years? Well, you know, basically trying to fit into these pants on a regular basis. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, do what I can for the Queen. I still... I still do what I can for the queen. I, is there I see. still a queen? Is there any specific queen that you do this well, for? I don't know. I'm on South Beach. I heard there were a lot of queens. Yeah. <laughs> so I just thought that this would be a good place for D'Artagnan. Absolutely. I, and I always thought my name was D'Artagnan, like I had a dark tan. I didn't know that there was a T-A-G-N-O-N. So there's like this French little, little conundrum. Oh, well, so I came here for a dark tanyan. Also, you have to understand that I usually mess up names anyway. So yeah. uh, well, give us the correct pronunciation. And this is for the world. How would you pronounce it? Dark tanyan. Dark, do you say it again? Dark, dark tanyan. Dark, dark tanyan. Yes, dark tanyan. Okay. That's actually, that's what the, the, the king would call me on the side when we would hang out together before we were banished, uh, but uh, it's... Do you, do you miss the castle? I do, I miss that whole thing, but I love the Deco district. You, well, you see, this is really the place to be. Yeah, and here, here, here's a man who isn't here by choice, but are you sorry you're here? No, I, I think that life, life brought me here, and I feel that I'm in, a, in as good a place as I was when I was protecting the castle. And if anybody would like to come down and, and talk with D'Artagnan about the old days and get an idea of what it's about, where can they, where do you usually hang out? Well, you can call 1-800-D'Artagnan and always find me there and then I have a website uh, called D'Artagnan.com which is also available. For okay, the so there, there you are folks. Well, thank you very much. Thank this you. has been a great interview. Oh, thank you very much. It's been a it's Bonjour. Been a great Bonjour, très bien. And now for something really special, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce the story lady. Welcome to our show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Do you have a story for us this week? Absolutely. What's it called? The Gift of Life. Tell us about it. Okay. The sweet couple couldn't get pregnant as they were too old when they wed. So after some tense years of trying, they adopted a child instead. The young boy felt loved and belonging, but often he questioned his roots. He wanted to know where he came from, but his parents feared all disputes. So rather than hurt those who raised him, he kept his need to himself. His desire to find his birth mother, he placed in the back of a shelf. He grew up, married, and turned to law. His specialty was in divorce. He did quite well till a client's ex-spouse showed up angry and with no remorse. She took out a loaded Glock pistol and aimed it at his big broad chest. Too late to duck or find cover, the bullets went right through his vest. They lodged in one of his kidneys. He needed a transplant to live. His adoptive parents were not a safe match. There was no good alternative. More dangerous was his rare blood type. A new kidney could face rejection without a donor with blood just like his. There was also the risk of infection. His family and friends placed ads where they could for both blood and kidney donors. But weeks went by without a near fit, even from strong, willing owners. Then, just as he was very near death, a woman, who seemed rather tipsy, offered her kidney with no strings attached. But she was a conniving gypsy. The nurses said no without testing her blood, but each day that went by, 
he got worse. When the gypsy returned with her offer again, this time they did a reverse. They tested her blood, and it proved to be right to go through with the operation. Her kidney was transplanted in him at once and showed total cooperation. When he recovered and went back to work, he wanted to thank all concerned, especially the gypsy woman whose whereabouts nobody learned. She skipped out at night without being discharged. The name she had given was wrong. And after a while, he went back to his groove, winning cases and staying strong. So he didn't meet the gypsy to tell her that he was better or thank her for her gift of life, not even in a snail mail letter. Several years later, when his son was born, he thought of the gypsy lady and eagerly renewed his lost search for her down long, winding roads that were shady. He found her in her fortune parlor, gazing into a big crystal ball. Come, sit down, she greeted him warmly. I knew that one day you would call. I see that you are on a mission to tie up all of your loose ends. My advice to you is to put trust in love and accept it as it transcends. I'm a seer, and ever since you were born, I've watched over your steady, firm climb. I've saved your life, and I gave you life and just waited for the best time. To tell you to give your parents a hug, have no doubt that you've met no other than the one who loved you enough to let go. My son, I am your natural mother. Well, thank you, Story Lady, for a really moving story. I enjoyed it, and I hope our audience did. Well, I'm looking at the clock on the wall, and it's time to say goodbye. But before I do that, I want to thank you all for listening to Conversations with Stuart Stewart on syndicatednews.net.